All right, let's talk about the big news of the day. And yesterday, President Biden doubling down on this bullshit narrative, I'm going to say that, uh, that somehow President uh, that, that Vladimir Putin is responsible for your inflated gas prices in the United States. And when you go to buy carrots, that somehow it's Vladimir Putin's problem. Again, I don't understand how they're doing this. The president came out yesterday to I- insist on releasing 180 million barrels of oil uh, from the strategic oil reserves. He's going to release 1 million barrels a day for the next like six months. But we have a lot of questions about this. But here's the president yesterday on this narrative. But as I've said from the start, Putin's war is imposing a cost on America and our allies and democracies around the world. Today, I want to talk about one aspect of Putin's war that affects and has real effects on American people. Putin's price hike that Americans and our allies are feeling at the pump. I know how much it hurts. As you've heard me say before, I grew up in a family like many of you where the price of a gallon of gasoline went up, it was discussion at the kitchen table. Our family budgets, your family budgets, to fill a tank, none of it should hinge on whether a dictator declares war. So today, I'm laying out a two-part plan, not only to ease the pain that families are feeling right now, but to end this era of dependence and uncertainty and to lay a new foundation for true and lasting American energy independence. Parenthetically, just imagine if, in fact, Europe didn't have to count on Russian oil, if they were energy independent, it would change the nature of so much. The problem we're facing with gas prices has... Grover doesn't agree with that. No, he's howling at the sort of disingenuity of it. I didn't... Disingenuity? Disingenuity. You sound it's, like... It's disingenuous, is what I'm saying. It doesn't yeah. come out right. You sound, uh, like, you sound like Biden on that. Yes. Um, <laughs> So I love when he says parenthetically. Well, what does that even mean? When someone says parenthetically, and then you can tell that he's like going off script to talk about Europe's uh, Europe's coziness with Russian oil. He's right about that. I mean, Finland gets ninety two percent of their oil from 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 Russia. So uh, they're, but they're also right along the border there. So right, it's like very it's and so is the Nor- lowest carbon Norway. footprint of that right, oil. Like, we'll take it right from you. Like, come on over. Yeah. We're right across the border here. Um, so again, and these are the headlines this morning. I love they put you know Biden on the one dollar bill. Yield inverts recession ahead, um, and that's what we're facing in the United States. We've we've talked about the indicators in the United States. We've talked about the yield curve inversion, and we've talked about how now you can expect you know you can expect to be making less money by buying certain assets, particularly U.S. Treasuries. Right, the negative the negative effects of that. But you know who's doing pretty well actually is Russia. So the reason we had we titled our show this way is because that's exactly that. There's a number of economists coming out this morning pointing to the rubles resurgence. And we're at a timeline right now and the headlines are moving fast and furiously this morning. So even maybe by the end of this show, we'll have an update on where Russia stands on making you pay for Russian oil using Russian rubles instead of U.S. dollars. Well, the deadline for that was yesterday. So President Putin had given the world about a two or three weeks notice that we, you know, you're going to put sanctions on us. Okay, but you still need our oil. So what we're going to do is no longer accept your currency for our oil, which the ruble at the time had been plummeting, now increases the value of the ruble because most nations cannot cut off their supply of gas from Russia. They just simply can't do it. So, so today chart. is the day. Yeah, yeah so, go ahead. Well, yeah, look at the chart. I mean, so, and as according to the Washington Post this morning, Russia's ruble and banking system are showing continued signs of recovery from the initial punch of sanctions as Moscow relies on energy exports and currency controls to partly protect the nation's economy. So last week we featured a story from a journalist who's been, he's in China and he's been covering what's been going on and had a really interesting take. And he talked about, did Putin really outmaneuver everybody? Mm -hmm. What was the gist of that? I mean, the gist was basically that- that in the current Cold War between the United States and China to be the default currency of the world, uh, Russia was not even in the running, right? And the problem is that the United States is not able to sustain the amount of global business that happens on the dollar because the dollar right now is the currency that two nations trade if they don't have a common currency. 
that happens. Um, China desperately wants that job because the United States is not growing commensurate with how much business happens on the dollar. So while the United States has been teetering on the brink of holding that position, China has been chomping on the bit to come in for that. Well, now Russia is saying, but you all continue to depend on our foreign exports now. So we're going to put ourselves in the position now to no longer collect on currencies that are not favorable to us. And we will, because you are so dependent on us, we're, we're going to collect in our own currency. Um, international leaders are saying this breaks certain agreements that we have in international trade laws. Russia doesn't care. They already yeah, who broke cares? laws. I don't care because think about this. Like, we, we have used that position to, to get countries to do whatever we want. It's like, you don't do yeah. what we want, we're going to put sanctions on you right. uh, mm-hmm. because we control so much of this economy. So this was bound to happen. I mean, Putin is doing what any smart person would do and getting away from a dollar that's, first of all, losing value every single sure. day. And, and, and like the other countries are going to join in with this as well because the, the, they don't want us to put sanctions on them. Be like, hey, if you don't do what we say, we're going to put sanctions on you and you're going to be hurting. Yes. And, and why would we think about if the shoe were on the other foot, right? Like if, if the ruble were the reserve currency of the world, how, how, how much debate would there be in the United States Congress on a regular basis about trying to move away from the ruble as a sure. reserve currency? Oh, like it's we'd all we'd hear. Fun. That's all we need to Already, be about. politicians are really afraid of, of cryptocurrency, is, which is something that they cannot regulate. Um, so, absolutely, that happens. You know, but I just I get so upset when I hear this it's Putin's fault that things cost you more when during the pandemic we had the largest transfer of wealth um, since I want to say. Um, since the slaves were freed. In fact, there's there's really interesting data about um, when slaves were free, um, how much that actually cost. It was like the government taking people's assets in the largest in history, right? Because um, this, they were so valuable um, and could be traded just like stocks. It was awful. Uh, but the pandemic, you know, made a lot of people really wealthy. It gave a lot of corporations more power than they had had before. They absolutely now can raise prices and stay high on the hog. And we can think that, oh, it's because of the pandemic. Okay, let's just blame the pandemic. Oh, it's because of this war. Let's just blame the war, right? But the government is actually spending, like we just said, uh, way more than it takes in. The United States government is in more debt than ever before. And Wall Street has done really well. So because of this wealth transfer, because of this government spending, we have inflation happening, but it's super convenient to blame it on something that's happening all the way around the globe. Right. Well, right. And, and if you track it, you can see that it actually was happening before all this Russia stuff even sure. happened. If you look at gas prices, yeah. they were on their way, way up at a at a even level and, and it never stopped. It never went down. And then when Putin invaded, it went up. It was on its a trajectory already. Yeah, yes. yes. And another piece of that, too, not only has gas prices been going up since the fall of last year, but th- which had nothing to do with Russia, in addition to which we've been sanctioning Russia for years Right. So Russia now is the most sanctioned country uh, in the world. And look at that. Before February 22nd, it was already highly sanctioned. Right now, after February 22nd, it accelerates beyond. And, you know, again, of course, it's, as Chris Minahan, the uh, one of the great journalists has been reporting, he, he says here, I and others have warned for years that the D.C. regime was overusing sanctions and that we'd all end up with at the end of this was a U.S. dollar. Uh, as the world's reserve currency um, was the end of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Oh. The collapse of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. That process is now accelerating, he says. When you, um, it, it really bothers me, too, that people don't like people are like, oh, well, we're not sending boots on the ground. We're not dropping bombs. Sanctions are fine. We can get behind sanctions. And they, they sell it as we're just going to put sanctions on them. They're not going to be able to do this. But understand, innocent people die with sanctions. So why would sure. any of these countries allow us to continually basically wage war mm-hmm. on them with sanctions? This makes no sense to me. Right. And as, you know, Dmitry Medved said, 
Medvedev. I can never say his name. Medveds, <laughs> I think. Medvedev. That's right. You just got to slow oh. it down. You, Medvedev. We, we, we speak so quickly. Med. Everyone at home, try to say it right now on your own. See if you screw it up or say it correctly. Uh, Medvedev. Medvedev says that the era of regional currencies is coming because confidence in reserve currencies is melting away. Abandoning the dollar and the euro does not look like a fantastical prospect anymore. And I have to say, this was an interesting interview uh, uh, that uh, that the Gray Zone did. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybakov um, had this to say. This was in 2019. So watch this video from 2019 where he talks about the U.S. as a reserve currency and what is coming as a result of this. 2019 that uh, people will continuously use dollar and the U.S. financial system as the, you know, cardiovascular system of the whole organism. That will not be the case. People will bypass in, in literal term and people will find ways how to defend themselves, how to protect themselves, how to guarantee themselves against any emergencies. China, Russia, others, we at the moment create alternatives. Then we will most probably move further into using not just national currencies, but baskets of currencies, currencies of third countries, other schemes, uh, modern barter schemes are among those, but th those are not sophisticated enough. But still, we will use ways that would diminish the role of dollar and U.S. banking system with all this risk of assets uh, and transactions being arrested. Right. right there. So Bitcoin doesn't look so crazy anymore. And he talk, did you he talked about a basket of currencies. So it's not right. just the ruble. It's, you know, it's it's Bitcoin. Yes. Um, and did you say that that interview is from 2019? 2019. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a gray zone interview from 2019 from with the deputy foreign minister of Russia talking about sanctions, talking about the U.S. reserve currency, and you're seeing it. And so, again, I come back to this article, which really was a jaw-dropping, stunning article. Uh, I don't know his full name, the this journalist from China, uh, but I think he really nailed it in this piece. Uh, what if Putin had outplayed us all? Skyrocketing ruble this morning. The demand that, hey, you want to buy, buy my gas? You got to buy it in rubles. You got to buy it in rubles. We're not taking dollars anymore. Uh, we're not taking euros. And this massive, and th again, that's why but President Biden. He makes Biden's the point in the article that he that he needed a war in order to do this, right? That maybe he wanted to do this all along. Um, that seems like a little bit of a connection that I can't really make because it does yeah. seem like what he's accomplishing in Ukraine, which is taking back Russian separatist areas, was also the goal, not not just right, financial. It, well, maybe it is, but maybe it is like a bridge too far. And it's like here, he knew how to play it, maybe. It's like this idea that you're playing this violin, you're playing these notes, knowing that, okay, once we do this into Ukraine, all of NATO is going to step up. What does that mean? Yeah. That means their dependence on us for oil, that, you know, they're going to let, they're going to levy even further sanctions upon us. Have we been able to sustain that? Are we able to do okay? So you can't go to McDonald's. You can go to other food places and, you know, in Russia, you mean, or yeah, in Russia. Right. Uh, so again, I, I just think this is a really fascinating story. One that I think we should all pay attention to because here in the United, you know, in the United States, you're think about all of the things that you're paying additional for. And the president of the United States, here's my biggest problem with the president releasing 180 million barrels of oil. Where's the plan around that decision? There's no plan. There's no economic plan. No, nothing, nothing, well, nothing, and, and nothing. And with those barrels, when they say release it, does that mean for sale to other countries? Like he's there. We're basically saying we're not we're going to make it so that you don't have to be dependent on Russia. You can depend on the United States for oil, because if that's the case, if we've got that much oil, why don't we use it here and take our own gas prices down and let the rest of the world worry about theirs for now? Well, yeah. he does seem to be saying he's going to release it into American society, um, which is interesting because but also to sell to Europe. Right. Right. Um, and economists will say, well, then that will sort of increase the demand and make us think that it's a bit cheaper. So we might normalize. Right. So it does not actually change any behavior. So then this dependency will go on. So then what is the long game? Right. So all of us here are thinking, wow, like, can I live my entire life dependent on expensive gas? 
what is the more sustainable solution? Of course, everyone's now looking at electric cars, um, looking at more sustainable solutions. Can we change to that? Well, not on a dime, clearly. So then what ball are we kicking down the road? You well, know, and, and, all of this and that kind of- also like, if they're going to uh, sell it nation or sell it out of the country, how does that benefit us? Like, are they still going to subsidize oil companies that are going to make, be making profits worldwide yes. now? I mean, they already make world profit, yes. but like, you know. Well, and of course, you heard of the president yesterday talking about price gouging and, and runaway prices. And so let me get this right. It's Putin's price hike. And yet you're also talking about price gouging and rising prices. And so we're going to tackle that. That's what the president said yesterday. That's what right. The, that's For what instance. The, where is name names? Tell us what which company is price gouging. If you're really if you're really saying this. Then tell us which companies are doing this. No, they they won't do that. For instance, this insulin bill that passed the House yesterday, right? So the House passed a bill that limits the price that consumers will pay for insulin, but it does not limit the price that companies charge for insulin. It just says that you, the consumer, will only pay $35 a month for your insulin. Your insurance company will pay the rest of it. So it allows price gouging from insurance companies, which keeps your premiums higher, right? It does not actually lower the price of insulin, only the price that you pay, which then, of course, that price is going to, that, that continued inflated price will continue to be passed on to us, just not out of pocket every month. Um, it's a crazy bill. Probably won't pass the Senate, but it's, you know, like pandering to voters who are insulin dependent. Like, that's a stupid solution. Come on. Right. It's the same. It's the same thing that's happening with gas. Like we still approve people to we still approve price gouging. Sure. Whatever. Um, But it just has to not feel like it or look like it to the average voter who's just too stupid to understand economics. Right. If you like this content, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Also, we have a membership program for the price of a cup of coffee once a month. You can support independent journalism just by going to morninginvest.com slash join. You get access to exclusive videos, plus the ability to join and chat with us live. We really appreciate your subscription and you are supporting independent journalism.